friend of mine that knew a friend and he had built a pole barn for the guy. And he said, Hey, he's looking for somebody that needs some dirt work done. And I went and met him. And this job has now turned into just over 10 years worth of work. What's happening, Skid Steer Nation? Welcome back for another episode of the Skid Steer Nation podcast. As always, I am your host, Ryan Deemer. Got a nice little treat for you guys today. Not often you get to meet somebody who just two short years ago was working part time, building their dream. And then to fast forward 24 months or a little bit more than that is running multiple crews, more than 12 employees, and went from doing little side projects for residentials to large civil construction sites. I'm excited to talk with Tyler today. Before I introduce him to the show, I do want to remind all of you faithful listeners, it's November when we're recording this. Tax season will be coming up next spring. Go buy some equipment. If you get some cash sitting in the bank, buy the equipment. There's definitely there's tax code law that allows you to write off the full value up to a million dollars of equipment this year. So if you've made some good money this year and you're worried about your tax implications for next year, invest in your business, guys. It's the best thing you can do. If you're looking for skid steer attachments, skidsteernation.com. We've got great high quality American made attachments. So with that, Tyler, welcome to the show, man. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. It's uh, I always like to point out when things didn't go smooth because that's real world stuff, right? So th- this is our third scheduled appointment to actually get this in. One time I had to reschedule on you because of my scheduling conflicts. And then the next time you had some projects running long and you weren't going to be able to make it to our time. So now after third time's a try, we just kept grinding through, finally made it work. And then we've just spent the last 15 minutes playing with computer settings because Zoom can be a pain in the ass. So little tip, pro tip, guys, things aren't going your way. Don't give up. Yeah, you can never uh, give up. You always got to push forward. and uh, Got to grind, to man. Win. Yep, got to grind, got to grind. So, Taylor, you're up in Michigan, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I had family in Kalamazoo. How far are you from there? Uh, about two hours north. Two hours north. Okay. Nice. And um, you're running about what, 12 employees now, you said? Yep. Yeah. We got uh, 12 employees. We got close to 14, including me and the office lady. Oh, that's awesome. And just two short years ago, it was just you, a pickup truck, a trailer, and a skid steer, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Did you ever imagine that you'd be investing that much money in capital equipment in 24 months? No, I, I guess I, uh, I didn't understand truly how much money it took. I knew it was an expensive industry. I've been in the industry my whole life. Uh, my family's been in concrete for 60 years. And then I pipelined for a couple, uh, couple months after that. And then I got into non-union federal demolition. So I understood the backside, kind of the backside that this stuff's not cheap. And it kind of hit me in the face like a brick that um, this stuff is really expensive, but I liked it. I liked what I did. I liked the industry. I like the growth. It's really cool getting to work with some really cool people on some pretty amazing projects. But yeah, it was definitely different. Well, I can't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nothing's cheap. I mean, I always joke because we go out to dinner with people that just work nine to fives and we, they always ask what I do for a living. I'm like, oh, we sell attachments for skid steers. Like, oh, cool. Like, what do those cost? I'm like, well, anywhere from a couple thousand dollars to 20, 25 grand. They're like, wow, that's a lot of money. And I'm like, it's the cheapest thing they own. It is. I mean, especially when you go out and look now at, um, like we went and bought excavators this year, two of them used, but I had $200,000 wrapped up in two excavators. Yeah. Not cheap. Not cheap. And then what people don't like people not in the, that aren't in the industry don't get is the maintenance cost to keep those $200,000 worth of the machines operating. Right. And I, it's really different because it's, um, I would say it's probably one of the most expensive industries to get into. And to keep alive. I mean, profit margins aren't very high, depending on the jobs you're working on, for sure. Um, But you got to you got to scale yourself correctly. And like you said, the maintenance, the maintenance is it's a killer. Especially when you have multiple trucks, skid steers, excavators, dozers, semis. Oh, insurance, work comp, that work comp can, can add up quick. Especially in this industry, because um, I didn't realize when I started that workers comp not only went off the industry you're in, but if it's a full-time job or not. Yeah. So especially up here, people get laid off. You know, we're, we're close to six and a half, seven percent unemployment rate. 
Wow. I mean, we're, we're capped out at, at a pretty high rate just because of the industry we're in. So the, the insurance and the workers comp side definitely doesn't help our industry out at all. No, it's, it, it's definitely expensive. I remember when I was in manufacturing and I was like running the company. So I would be in the shop a little bit, but I spent majority of my time in the office. Like we would fight tooth and nail with the insurance company. Cause I had the highest salary in the building that I was not a, a full-time member of the shop. Mm -hmm. And they wanted, they wanted to calculate my work comp at that. Like, well, yeah, but he's still in the shop. I'm like, I'm in the shop 10% of the time. And like, we had to find a cat. Uh, so we were, I guess we were able to, we were able to find a way to calculate a percentage of office and then a, a percentage of that. But like originally though, if you just let it go, the insurance agent, they'll just whack you at the highest level they can. Like you got to audit that. Yeah. There are uh, a lot of companies like that are all about money, putting their yeah. own money in their own pockets. They don't, uh, they don't care too much about how they're, or who they're insuring. Yeah. And I always thought it was funny with the work comp insurance because it's all based on your overall numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, like how many, like there's years we got to check back from them because we overpaid because we didn't hit sales numbers we said we were going to hit. But then there's other years you get a bill. And I'm like, the guys work the same amount of hours. Like, what's the difference? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, mine might be different because mine runs off of how much total payroll we pay a year. Okay. So... If we don't pay, you know, I'm, I think mine's up to $125,000 in payroll. I'm sorry. You're right. It was based off payroll. It wasn't sales. I am mistaken. Yep. I will I would admit no. that I'm wrong on that. <laughs> well, it's it's like you said, if you don't, if you, uh, like, you know, mine's up to like 125 or 150 or whatever, and we're way surpassed that. And I obviously have not had enough time to call my insurance agent. Yeah. Um, but if I don't up my policy past what I'm going to pay in payroll, I have to pay the difference at yep. the end of the year. And they, they don't, they're not, they don't take it easy on you. They don't take and be like, oh, well, it's, you know, it was $6,000 for a quarter. You're going to pay another six grand. They're going to yeah. charge you 10, 11, $12,000. If not, I got to stay on top of it so I can get a little bit of a bump at the end of the year. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. And and you're growing at a pretty substantial rate. So that's something you probably have to audit on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, it's been tough. It's especially with the insurance side of things and payroll and keeping up with all that stuff and workers comp and trying to stay legal on all that side. Because just a few short months ago in April, we had three employees and we were doing like $10,000 projects, $8,000 projects, little driveways and just cleaning people's yards up and hauling stuff for people. So over six months, seven months, it's grown astronomically where it's been, you know, most nights I work till 10, 11 o'clock at night back up at 5 a.m. just yeah. to keep up the pace everything yeah so what was it like did you specifically go out and search for like a large residential like a large commercial job or did they find you and it was just like a natural progression or how did you go from three in april to 14 now in november so when i started this i had a big dream I'm not even close to where I want to be. I want the, this. I want this to be a 500 employee company. I want it to be a large, considered a large corporation. But no, I didn't technically go and search for jobs. I was always keeping my eyes out. I was watching commercial jobs. I was kind of doing some standing back and just watching, seeing how these projects were going on and talking to people just so I knew how to bid them and how the projects worked and how federal funding worked just to kind of learn more. I didn't want to jump in, go bid a project, jump in and and be, you know, over my head, not knowing what was going on. But the project that we're on now, they had actually, it was just a friend of mine that knew a friend, word to mouth, and he had built a pole barn for the guy. And he said, hey, he's looking for somebody that needs some dirt work done. Um, and I went and met him. And this job has now turned into just over 10 years worth of work. 10 years? Yeah, we have uh, RV parks to build in every state. <laughs> That's amazing, man. That's yeah, we amazing. Got, uh, we got this RV park. We'll do close to $8 million on this RV park. We got 500 more houses to build for a private subdivision, which will be like a really high level subdivision, you know, quarter million dollar, half million dollar homes, and then RV parks everywhere. So is that subdivision the same guy with the RV parks? Yes. Everything's with the same guy. Wow. Are you worried about having all your eggs in a one customer basket? Yes and no. Um, we've made a really good relationship over the last couple of months and I've met some of the investors that are involved in the projects. Um, and I've done a little bit of research on what they've done in the past and they have a pretty good track record. They've been doing projects like this. They, most of what they've done is in Hawaii. So they've, they've had a 20 year track record in Hawaii building high rises 
and really luxurious hotels and doing stuff for Hawaii when natural disasters hit and stuff. So um, they got a good track record. I am a little worried. You can't ever trust anybody too much. I don't really ever think you should. It's never a good idea, even if it's family or friends or a business partner for 20 years. You just never know. But no, I don't have all my eggs in one basket. Just try to spread it out as much as I can because you never know. This might go sideways and then I'm out of work with all the equipment and stuff I supplied to to do these projects. Yeah. So what's your plan with the out-of-state parks as this thing grows? Are you going to send your Michigan crews to those states and have them just live in hotels or campers? Or are you going to have to like hire local laborers in that area? I got really lucky, actually. Um, So when I started this project, we were doing sewer and water, and I didn't really know a whole lot about it. And I found a guy three days before the job started that's been in the industry 20 years. And he come on and he's been running this project, the the dirt side for me, the underground, I guess you could say. And um, he's going to start yet another dirt crew with guys that he used to work with, um, take them from a bigger company and they're going to come run my dirt sites. We'll have company or crews that go out of state and then crews that go to get out of state, but or to other projects. That's awesome. And does he have any interest in like getting ownership in the business as it expands and grows? Or is he just content being the top dog he, in supervision? He wants to be the top dog in supervision. He wants to make, you know, good money, have a company truck and a company phone and insurance yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And we'll work into that. But yeah. uh, he doesn't really want a whole lot of uh, ownership. That's a blessing when you can find a guy like that. Because like entrepreneurship's not for everybody. But a lot of people, until they try it, think they want to own the business. Mm-hmm. So when you can find a guy with that much knowledge and skills and experience and network, and he's just like, I'm cool being your right-hand man, that's exciting. Yeah, and it's it's uh, very hard to find in today's labor force. Yeah. I would say, I mean, it, you know, you can talk to a lot of companies that are already shorthanded as it is. And to have a guy like that fall in our lap here as a company not only helps us out with good people, but like you said, good knowledge, good background. He has a lot of connections. And he takes a bunch of stress off my shoulders because I, I see the way it is growing companies. I can't do it all myself. I have to have people and systems set in place so they can come do the things that I need to have done and they can handle a team as their own. So I can take my focus away from doing the work at hand to finding other people to do other work. It's the hardest thing for an owner to do because it's your baby. The business is your baby and you're so worried about giving up control because of people won't do it the way you do it. It's so hard. Yep. I think I've noticed that a lot and I've really had to push that to the side because of course everybody likes their thing. their certain way done and it is your baby. It's, it's your pride and joy. It's, it's everything you've ever had putting all your money into and your whole entire life into. And a lot of people don't realize how much time and money you spend on a business to get it up off the ground and get it going. Yeah. I mean, you, you waste a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say you waste time, but you you give up a lot of family time and family events and Christmases and Thanksgivings and stuff like that to to build your dream. A hundred percent. In fact, you know, it took me years upon years, the first business I owned in my 20s, to to finally understand that I was so fixated on getting everybody to do it the same way I did that I didn't care. I, I was so fixated on the process. I wasn't fixed on the outcome. And like years later, I was just like, well, do it however you want, but this is what the end needs to be. And I, that was when I'm like, oh, now I know what my dad meant when there's nine ways to skin a cat. Like, <laughs> That's very true. Because I've, like I said, I've learned the hard way watching some of my guys do this stuff. And I'm like, that's not the way I would do it. Maybe you guys should do it this way. And I've kind of just had to step back and keep my mouth shut and just tell them this is the end project or the, uh, the total end that I'd like, like you'd stated before. But let them do their process. Obviously, everybody's done something different. He has the way that it works for him and his guys. And he's training those guys to work the way he wants them to work. So as long as it has a good end result, I just I kind of keep my mouth out of it. Because I have told some guys, hey, that's not the way to do it. You should probably do it this way. But they don't understand the way that my thought process is working to tell them or my process that I've learned. And they take their process and try to implement my process in the mix of it. And it's never a good outcome. It's never a good outcome. Yeah. I, I learned a long time ago that I'm left-handed, man. So like my thought process is not the same as most people. 
It isn't. I've, I, I just, like I said, I have to, I have to stand back and it's like watching your kid walk for the first time. It's very weird. <laughs> Do you have any young kids? I don't. No, me neither, man. Me neither. No, I'm, you, are you married? Uh, I was married years ago and divorced and we're, we I have a, a, a fiance now, but um, she's unable to have kids and we never had kids in our first marriage. So. Well, congratulations that you got somebody in your life. Yeah, thanks, man. So yeah, we're, now we get to play the role of the spoiling aunt and uncle, and we do a good job of that. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, our 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 ne- one nephew just turned 16, and like he's over here all the time. Like, can I mow the yard? I'm like, you need cash for gas. He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right, go ahead and mow the grass. <laughs> like, because I'm a big proponent. I'm like, well, you got to do something. Like, you no know handouts, because I don't want you to think you life's handouts. And he doesn't think that way, but. Well, that's good. There's, it's, uh, yeah. there's not very many people training kids to be that way anymore. Yeah. And if we do something special for him, like he want, you know, he wanted these new ostrich skin boots. Like we made sure it was the beginning of school. So like it was a gift for clothing for school, not just because in the middle of July. Right. I totally agree with that. Yeah. So just find those moments in the year that you can say, oh, it's for this. Not just, a, you know, here you go. Have it. Right. Where, yeah. where, are, uh, where are you located? So we're in Peoria, Illinois. So we're about two and a half hours south of Chicago and about two and a half hours north of St. Louis. Okay. Not too far from my homeland. Where's that at? Northern Michigan. Oh, no, not at all, man. No. Yeah, we spent all of our summers in Kalamazoo. My uncle lived up there, my dad's brother. So yeah, that's, that's, where I, uh, that's where I originally did most of my demo work for, for a year and a half when I did demolition. Almost all of my work was in between Jackson, Kalamazoo, and Albion. All right. So you, do you know Oswego Plain well then? Yep. That's where that's where they're actually from. I just say Kalamazoo because most people don't know Oswego and Plain well. Yeah, there's there's uh, a lot of small towns around those areas that most people don't really know exist until you yeah. look, until you're really there or look really close on a map. Absolutely, man. Yeah. So I mean, you went from 3 to 12 like a, in a blink of an eye, a snap of a finger. Like were you behind the eight ball with getting like checklists and systems and processes in place? Or was it just a free for all for a while? And like, what did that, what, tell me a little bit about that. It's still a free for all. It is, it is a total nightmare. I am, I'm, I'm a deer in the headlights. I've got a lot of it figured out. The guys, it's just kind of got to kind of just have guys fall into place and have all their own systems in play. And we just set up our own little things that work best for us with daily reports and how plans work and teach you guys and per diem and payroll and what they get paid and how it works, all that stuff. But I wasn't technically behind the ball, I would say. I didn't have enough work for any more guys than I had when I started this spring with the three guys. And I had been enough concrete work that I could kind of say, hey, you guys kind of go do your own thing. I hired another guy, so they had four guys total, and I was just by myself, and I had a buddy of mine come help me, and we just kind of worked three days a week while the concrete crew worked elsewhere, and I had finally got this project, and then I was definitely a deer in the headlights for sure, because I had nowhere near the people to complete the project. Yeah. I just uh, I went on a kind of like a big hiring spree and just hiring anybody I could. So, I mean, I remember we doubled our staff and again, like we went from like two to four, but I remember the first time, the first day that the two new people joined the team and I was like, oh man, now I got to think for five of us, not three of us. And they're like, all right, how do I do that task? I'm like, oh man, I don't have that outlined. Like, I'm like, I got to go backwards and start building out these step-by-steps for certain things or morning routines or daily rituals that we want to accomplish for each division. And I, I mean, I just can't imagine what it'd be like going from three to 12. And I, when I felt that way, going from two to four. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, have learned pretty quick that you have to have a process from start to finish of everything you do. And it definitely helps that I have two amazing foremans that understand not only the end goal that I have for the company and they're on that track to grow that with me, but they understand the process that we normally do and how we like things to work. And then I don't have to, I, I kind of watch from the back and kind of just pinpoint some things about what these guys are doing differently that I kind of bring up to the foreman if they haven't noticed it. But most of what they do is training them themselves and then just giving me the feedback. Hey, we need a new guy or this guy needs some training, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. How has that been? Like, I mean, because I'm assuming when you got to hire that quickly, like the vetting process probably gets 
half the attention it really deserves. Have you hired substantially more than you have on staff now? Have you, have you burned through a lot of guys or have you been pretty lucky? Uh, 32 guys this year. 32 guys. Yep. Yeah. They'd, they'd come for a couple of weeks and I'd be like, yo, you don't, you know, unfortunately you don't make the cut. We've been trying to train you. You're just not, I wouldn't say people aren't trainable, but you, you know, some people just aren't a good fit. Yeah. Uh, or we've had people quit because they don't like somebody else on the crew. And it's just, it's a lot of headache, but you kind of have to weed through the good and the bad people to, to make the crew good for you. Cause you can find good people, but they don't make a good fit for what you have going on or the guys you have working already. So you kind of yeah. just have to find all the puzzle pieces to fit well together. So have you found that your interviewing process has improved because of all those failures? Like are you, are you dialing in more culture personality type questions and not more not, and less? How do you, do you know how to run a machine or do you know how to run grade? Yeah. I've, I've really learned that um, the backstory that people tells more than what they do on the job site. Yeah. Um, because I have some, some young kids. I wouldn't say kids are only, you know, I'm 22 and they're only two years younger than me. But you can tell from their backstory of what they've done before, how often they go through jobs or their thought process on things that you can tell from there if they're trainable or not, or if this is even the industry for them, or if they want to grow from the industry they're in now to transfer from company to my company to continue moving forward in the process of growth. Yeah. When you start learning how to interview a little better and like, and you're really clear on the culture you want to have. I find that the guys, they all go through the same maturation process that you went through, right? Like there's a spurt that forces hiring and then them to go, this is not the way I want to hire. Like it's not, I don't want to play Russian roulette with every employee I hire. Mm -hmm. And they start, they start thinking and focusing on how they're going to interview or what the company is like. And, and that's when they start seeing better, you know, less turnover, less churn because the guys that just that you're firing after a week, they never even get hired. You yeah, know, it's it's definitely a, a better screening process in the beginning that you get to. I guess I don't know how you would say that. Kind of stop those people from coming in to begin with. Yep. Um, it, because it is a headache. I mean, when you hire people like that spur of the moment and you don't really interview them. I mean, we've had quite a few guys that they contact me. Hey, looking for a job, and I ask them, "Can you finish concrete?" And they say, "Yeah." I'm like, "Okay, start Monday." And that's that's as far as it makes it. And then they start, <laughs> and I'm like, four days later." what am I doing? Why did I even hire this guy? Yeah. And it's nothing against people. It's just, like I said before, some people are cut out for it and they like the industry and they want to be a good fit. And some people aren't. Yeah. But I mean, the more you do that and the more people that are there four to 10 days, the more the crew that you actually rely on goes, Oh, great. Got to train a new guy so we can be here for 10 days and we got to do it all over again. Like it, 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 it wears on them too. Yeah. And, and it makes a bad rapport with everybody else because all they want is just one guy that just wants to stick around and it's been yeah. four guys yeah. now or five guys or, you know, two guys, whatever it was that, like you said, they had to train them and then everybody has to fall back into place because they have to find a spot for this guy to fit in the crew with his job title. And it just doesn't, it doesn't always work out. And, and it really stresses out everybody else, including the foreman. Now the foreman's trying to please the company as an aspect to a total goal when they have to slow down as a whole to try to make one guy fit into the role. Yeah. And it's crazy because you'd been better off being two men short for two weeks and finding the right person. You've been, you've been farther along the project. I'm assuming than slowing down to train, to fire, to hiring, to slowing down, to train. You're like, it actually slows your process down. I bet. Yeah. And it's a very bumpy ride. And it's like you said, it's stressful for everybody. I could take one guy off that crew completely for two weeks and the guys could just work better that way. Instead of this this dramatic up and down of emotions and feelings and, and stress in the crew every couple of days because they got this new guy and, well, where is he? And does he know what he's doing? And I got to train him. And if you just don't have him, everybody knows what they can and can't do within themselves already. And they can just work better that way. Absolutely, man. So did you ever see yourself building mobile home park or RV parks? No. <laughs> not at all honestly i i didn't even figure i would be doing concrete either um, oh really i figured that would I be wanted, a natural maturation process for you with your family background i wanted nothing to do with concrete at all i didn't want to ever see wet concrete again a day in my life i just wanted to move dirt because i thought making dirt flat looked pretty 
Yeah. Okay. okay. That was the so, whole aspect of it. And I don't know. Now I, I never thought I would see myself even being in business at this point. No, no, no. I really thought I would just stick with a company and, and be a foreman or a superintendent at, at some point in time. And I got burned one too many times at a couple different companies for tens of thousands of dollars. And I'm like, yep, that's enough. I'm going to be the one in control of all that now. Yeah. That's no matter what industry the background is like, that seems to be like the, the bright torch that most excavation business owners walk. Like that, that's the, that's what illuminated their path. Was there somebody at the company that they don't like or screwed them over or, and they're like, Nope, I'm done with this. I'm gonna go do my own thing, control my own destiny. Yep, and that's where it starts. And you just got to keep your head down and you got to have, you got to have drive. And I, and you know, a lot of people have drive and some people don't have drive and you have to make that drive for yourself. And everybody hits, you know, they start a business and they hit a, they hit a plateau or they hit a hard spot and then they quit. All oh, this isn't for me. You got to keep your head down and look through the dark time to realize that, yeah, it's shitty now, but tomorrow's going to be fine. Everything's going to work out. You know, everybody has a hard day today and it's going to be great again tomorrow. You just got to realize that it's just because it's hard today doesn't mean it's going to be hard forever. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, yeah, it's so true. I mean, fall in love with doing the work, not the outcome. Because mm-hmm. if you can't do that, then it's going to be a long road. For sure. And I, I've, I've really come to learn, too, that um, it's not always about the money. No. You can't, I don't truly think you can be in business with a hundred percent mindset of just going home with a paycheck because then you're not fully into what you're doing. You have to fully believe you got to have your heart and soul 110% all the time into the business that you're in and the industry that you're in to push it forward. Especially it's different when you have a big company and you just go buy another company or go start another company. And you already understand how the processes work and you can just set people in that business to make a profitable business. But starting something from nothing, you definitely have to have that drive to look through all the bad and get up to the good. Absolutely. You know, there's different personality types too. So like for me personally, I've had to learn that like I'm not money motivated. So if if everyone's like, hey, you can start this business and you can make 10 million. I'm like, am I going to like going to work every day? Because my answer is no, the 10 million means nothing to me. Right. Because you know, the money's learn, not worth being miserable. It's not worth being miserable. Like some people are like, screw it, I'll do it. I can put my nose down for five years and walk out. I can't do that. Like I gotta enjoy what I do. So we uh, you know, like we actually just had this meeting today um with some other business owners and we were talking about it. And I was just like, I've had to change my mindset from helping other people have a better life with either the attachments we sell them that make the job easier for them or with the coaching and consulting that we do for business owners, helping them build a solid, strong structure business. Like I have to focus on the number of those people I want to help and not the money. Like the money needs to be the byproduct for me. So my personal goals always learn out to like number of people I can help and not the how much money I can make doing it. Right. And like you said, everybody's got their own different thing. For me, it's I like seeing stuff with my name on it. Yeah. Because it wasn't only that I got screwed out of a company, was I had everybody leave on a big multi-million dollar pipeline project. And myself and another 20-year-old were left with two crews to run and finish the project ourselves. And we never got a thank you or anything. And I'm like, I want to be the guy that shows everybody appreciation. And I want to be the guys that show my guys that we're a cool company to work for and we can do cool things and we can have nice trucks to drive and be them that that company because i've worked places and i've never had a nice shirt to wear or i never got a company sweatshirt or company t-shirts or i drove a junk truck that wouldn't even make it down the highway and get pulled over by dot and you know it's it's definitely a, a tough thing and when i started this it was you know all my guys have any shirts they ever wanted they got shirts and sweatshirts and hats and go buy them gloves. And it's the little things that, that make people feel appreciated. And it definitely helps that every time somebody drives by a job site, we got skid steers and excavators and trailers and pickups with my name on them. Yeah. That just, it's, I don't know. It's just something that I've always wanted. I've always wanted to be the guy that like anybody talks about, Hey, who does excavation? Oh, that Collins kid does. So are you going to, I mean, as you continue to grow, are you going to drop the land services and just be like Collins? Like, 
like all the big yeah. companies are like you got Kiwit, Stark and all like, you know, it's just Collins. Yeah, I would really like to change it um, at some point in time. I mean, we're not big enough, obviously, now to do that. But I'd like to change it to just Collins or Collins Industries or Collins Incorporated. Yeah. Just, you can just do it now. Name. Totally do it now. You got you got a guy with how much work for how many years? Like nobody needs to know who you are for a while. You could rebrand totally. It just sounds like a little too much money to rewrap a bunch of trucks and excavators. Oh, no. <laughs> just, yeah, just do it as as you buy, as you replace. Yep. Yeah, for sure. It takes a little time. It does. It does. If you just keep like the color schemes and the font the same, so that way, whether it says the whole name or just Collins, they can still associate it between the two. You could do it one piece at a time and it, it would be cohesive. Yep. Cause I don't, um, you're from Illinois. I don't You might not be familiar with them. Um, but there's a company here in Michigan called team Elmers. Okay. And they have a, an absolutely wonderful brand. It's just team Elmers. I mean, you see their gravel trains, you obviously know they do gravel stuff and dirt work and you see their cement trucks, you know, they do concrete. So, um, so you said you did pipeline work, right? Yes, sir. Did you work for a company based out of Wisconsin? Out of Euclid, Wisconsin. <laughs> Is that the one that screwed you over? No. Okay. No, okay. that was a wonderful company to work for. Actually. I really enjoyed working for them. The company that kind of screwed me over was out of uh, um, Washington. So I'm assuming the company you're talking about was Wisconsin's Michaels. Uh, Precision pipeline. Precision pipeline. Well, right. now it is technically Michael's, yes, but okay, maybe they've done a bunch of mergers this year, and I don't know who owns who anymore. That guy's done some amazing stuff growing a business, for sure. He's got a, a very big industry, uh, big, or a big business, because I believe he does po uh, power lines and stuff now too, doesn't he? I, I don't know about that, but they ran a new pipeline through Central Illinois, and like he ran it out the whole back half of a John Deere dealership for a laydown yard. <laughs> like, like John Deere dealership had no stock on any attachments or small equipment because they didn't have any space at their dealership because he rented out half their yard. That doesn't surprise me. Those pipeline companies got a lot of money. Like Precision, for example, has a whole laydown yard in Southern Michigan just in case they get a job here. That's got probably 30, 40, 50 million dollars in equipment sitting in a laydown yard that hasn't just moved in years. Just sitting, just just good tax write off, I guess. Just yeah, they just need the depreciation on the equipment for taxes. Oh man! So if this mobile, if this RV park continues to flourish the way it is, I'm assuming we talked earlier. You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. What's your vision or growth strategy to be able to service other customers outside of just that one investment group? The way I've envisioned it is just like I have before. We collect enough work until it's just about too much for what we got going on so that I could set off two, maybe three guys to just go do these projects. And then I fill their pipeline. And then as stuff gets bigger, where it's overwhelming for the guys I got now, hire a couple more guys to set them off to go do these smaller projects I got, just have them kind of run around. And then I can fill their pipeline so we can just, just like I did with the concrete and the dirt, you know, originally all I had was dirt work and it was barely enough for me. Until I had enough dirt work that I couldn't do it seven days a week. And I hired a couple guys to help me out. And then we had enough dirt work that I couldn't do it with my three or four guys. So I'd hire more guys. Or then I'd bid concrete and I couldn't do it myself with the dirt stuff. So I'd just hire a couple of guys to go do it here and there. Until I could fill their pipeline enough that they couldn't do the work themselves anymore. Even with one crew where I would have to hire more people. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if you're willing to travel the whole United States, like I would assume you could build such an amazing portfolio of this RV park that you could go find investment groups specifically for RV and mobile RV parks and mobile home parks and just be a specialty niche for those two industries. Yeah, and unfortunately, I guess fortunately and unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, I would really like to take this because I don't like I like being in the excavation industry and I like being the contractor but I want to be the project owner. I want to be the investment guy. I'd like to take the money that I take from this industry and keep this industry alive with my company, but then just be my own GC on my own projects. Okay. So I could take money from one business. I could take it from one basket and put it in another basket. And then that basket could fill another basket of just my own companies. Yeah. Self-storage would be a good one for that. Yep. Actually, I, that's what some of my family does. Is it? 
Yep. All in Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Okay. Or Michigan. Yeah, because they, they need just easy dirt work and concrete flat work, and those buildings can't be that hard to put up. No. I've watched them half a dozen times. They're, they're pretty simple. Yeah. Then you put a gate on it, and now they have those automated key card entries and cameras, and you can pay a company over in Slovenia pennies on the dollar to manage the cameras, people coming in and out. I think you do automatic withdrawals every month and never have an employee on site other than just regular maintenance check-ins. Yep. Yep, we actually, uh, my family that's been in concrete, my one uncle, that's all he does is build those storage unit pads. Yeah. yeah. All over. I mean, he does, on good days, he does 20, 25,000 square foot of concrete. Wow. I was, I'll tell you another business that, like, the first time I met a guy that owned one of these, I was like, this seems too easy. He had, like, a 20-acre piece of flat land just outside of the suburbs in Chicago, filled it all with gravel, put it a fence up around it and he just charged truck drivers a monthly fee. And this is where they could park their truck and leave their car in between runs. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, he was doing like a half a million dollars a month. And, well, and, and, and Chicago is definitely a, a, a good central hub for that as well. Yeah. But like, I just never thought of a need to have like a lay down yard for trucks when like you get three days off work and you need, just want to, you know, in and out of the city. But in the amount of money he was making was insane. And they just, all they did was fuck around with gravel all day. And they had different skid steers and attachments and tractors and a rock spreader and a bulldozer. And then they had this company. I think, I think it was Slovenia that managed the cameras and they just had a camera at the gate and the guy showed the card and then they would check the card to the ID and say, okay, you're clear and open the gate and let them in and out. There's a million ways to make money. You just got to find your niche. You just got to find one. Yeah. Especially with people like that, their, uh, their imagination really helps them out on that aspect of things. And they find where in society these things need to be put in place. Yeah. And then they just like, like, um, there's a, I can't remember the saying, but they always, uh, there was a saying that said, fill the need. You'll always get the money. hundred percent. And like he did, that he found a need in society that needed to be filled and he filled the need and just so happened to be making really good money off of it. And, and, And nine times out of 10, it's so simple. We overlook it. Like, there's a problem that you as a business owner are having every day and you can just look at it and go, Oh, I could build it. Like somebody could build a business to solve this one problem. And I would pay X amount of dollars a year or a month for that service or that product. Every and time. If, and if we just started to look around like that, like I know guys that like they invest in the stock market and all that. And like all of their investments are from products that they buy and consume on a daily or monthly basis. Right. I'm like, why'd you buy Under Armour? He's like, because my whole closet's full of Under Armour. Like, that's their whole strategy for investing. It was like, they're products and companies that I use on a regular basis. Yep. And it's it's the same thing I've done with automatic uh, voicemails and phone call returns and emails and stuff like that. And my bidding software is the same way. Somebody had found a niche in the industry to connect contractors like myself with privately funded projects and federally funded projects. On the state, municipal, federal, city, county side of things, as well as the private contractor side, to fit me with people, not only from just the state, but anybody that's putting on projects out there. Um, And they just set up a software that you can log into and look at all these projects and bid on them. And it is a lot of money. It's like three or $4,000 a year. But That's nothing, though. In the grand scheme of the work you pick up, it's nothing. Right. I can bid on one project, yeah. um, one half million dollar project, and I could pay for that software for 10 years. Yeah. Have you ever have you ever looked at the the SAM, the government website for procurement for projects? Yep. I mean, that's yeah, so, a full time job. Yeah, we're a part of SAM.gov. We're a part of uh, Construct Connect, which is that privately funded one that goes into mm-hmm. private sector stuff a little bit, um, as well as BidNet Direct. They take care of all the federal and uh, state stuff in the state of Michigan. But I would think it's worth three thousand dollars a year just to have somebody filter out all the projects on Sam, the government website. So you're only seeing things that are actually relevant to you. So see, that is what's so amazing about Construct Connect is you can set your own parameters. Mm-hmm. And they will send you daily emails every morning of what projects within a certain area that you'd like to work in, in certain. Uh, aspects, whether it's federal, state, or privately funded, 
in the parameters of which you want to work in, whether it's concrete or underground utilities or sewer and water or just subgrade, final grade work or demolition, and you can get emails every morning of work that of just the work you want to bid on. Yeah, that's awesome. Because we set it up for Sam to get notifications daily for certain theirs are all based on like number codes, if I remember right. Like, oh, you want to mm-hmm. learn about this type of equipment when they're buying it. And you're like, yeah, I want to because we manufactured skid steer attachments. And that code covered so many ranges of equipment that every day you get it and it has nothing to do with skid steers or attachments. And then I got to the point where I just quit reading it. And then I'm like, I'm sure I've missed five opportunities in the last mm-hmm. year. But because there was no way to filter it down, like what you're saying with the Construct Connect. So that's, a, I mean, that in itself is worth it. And it's it's worth it tenfold because it's my time that I've wasted reading through, you know, like um, BidNet Direct puts out 26,000 bids a year. So just, just, just to look through those and be like, oh, well, I don't want to do asphalt. I just wasted 10 minutes reading a procurement that has nothing to do with what I'm interested in. Yep. That means I can look five minutes on my email every morning and, oh, well, there's a job I want to bid on and then I can go bid on it. But if not, I didn't waste any time not looking for stuff that I didn't want to do. I love that, man. Tyler, you're finding ways to to save your time in a day because we only have 24 hours. Yep. And I'm only one guy. I can't uh, I can't I can't put the pipe in the ground, have the meetings, be here with you tonight, do the concrete and everything else. Right. That's awesome, man. Yeah, and I love your growth strategy. Like, let's just get, let's grow to the point where we're so uncomfortable, we have to hire a few more and then repeat the process. I, I think that's, uh, I think that's where a lot of people should be in business is you have to be uncomfortable all the time. You have to be at a point where you're like, do I just quit? Like, this is too much for me. <laughs> and then just figure out a way to, to get over it, honestly. Yeah. Um, Cause there's, I mean, just to the point, just for people starting, like, should I quit my job? Like that should make you uncomfortable and be like, we, we should make that jump. It is an uncomfortable jump to make, but you have to be 100% in yourself to know that you can make it past that point. And everything we've done past then is, I mean, I am uncomfortable 14 hours a day with everything I do. Should I do that? Should I not do that? What is the next step? And just putting my head down. And knowing that it's going to be good on the other side of it and finding a way to make it good when I get to the other side of the problem I'm with that I'm uh, that I'm dealing with. Yeah. So did you have to like learn to stop second guessing yourself after you made a decision? I still do it. Yeah. Do you, it's, do you I guess to, it's not. Do you a, try to drown it out though. Like, all right, I already made my decision. We're sticking with it. To an extent, yes. I think it's still a good thing that I do because obviously I, I come to a, a problem and I make a decision right then and there to to get past the problem. But then I do, I mean, I kind of call it like a job costing, I guess you could say, as I kind of look back at every decision I make and say, now that I see the end result of the decision I made, was there something different I could have done that could have bettered the result? Oh, I think that's great. I was talking about second guessing the decision. Like you make a decision and then you're like, oh, wait, is that the right one? Should I do something different? Like, I think right. so many business owners do that. Where like, make a decision, live with it, assess the outcome, make the necessary changes, pivot for the next time you get to do it. Correct. Yeah, you've got to always be job costing or what you call it there. You know, you've always got to be reassessing the outcomes of your decisions. So that's how your decisions get better. Right. Because if you... It's it's learning from mistakes. If you don't, if you keep hitting yourself in the hand with the hammer and not learning to not do it, you're not going to get a different outcome. Yeah, I always tell everybody, I'm like, you couldn't tell me the steps you did one by one on a job that went perfect. Like a year from now, I'd be like, oh, I don't remember how I did that job. I just know it was easy. You can tell me every aspect of a project when it was like a shitty job and like you had to grind and fight through it. You don't forget those mistakes, man. That's the lessons. Right. And those are always the best ones to learn. Oh, that's it, why they're expensive. It, <laughs> every time. Yeah. That's why divorce is so expensive. I hope I never have to go through that. <laughs> uh, I was joking. Somebody out there is laughing and some guys going, that's not funny. <laughs> there is both sides to that for sure. Oh, hundred percent. I actually had a friend of mine. This was when I was like, I was like 20 years old, 22 he was an alumni from the college I was at. And he was like, you know why divorces are so expensive? And I go, no. 
He's like, cause they're fucking worth it. Like, I'm like, your wife must've been miserable if you're willing to <laughs> get her out of your life for that much money. He's like, Oh, best decision I ever made. So, okay. Like you said, there's nine ways to skin a cat. Uh, oh, hundred percent, man. hundred percent. Oh man, Tyler. I think we've, this has been great. We've just been flowing and talking and I've been, I've really enjoyed this, but I want to be respectful of your time. I know you've probably got some more work to grind through tonight. I, I I would like to as as much as I do have work to do, I could sit here and talk all night. I know, me too, me too. In fact, uh, we're we're doing an after hours podcast. I don't usually do a lot of recording in the evenings like that, so um, I actually cracked a beer tonight. So I've been sipping on a little bush latte while we've been having our chat. And then, if anyone out there's on YouTube watching, if you're from Texas, there's my ode to Casey Donahue. I got a scusi on the beer, so. I was being respectful. I do have a Michelob Ultra sitting over here. Ah, there. that a boy right, right there. there. Yeah, no. Our respect goes out the window after 5 p.m., man. Like, we got to do what we got to do to get through the evening. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're busy guys. You got to have, uh, got to do what you have to, like you said, do what you got to do to get through yeah. the days. Yeah, I mean, not, I'm not drinking a 12-pack tonight, but one or two just to, I've had a tough day today, man. I mean, you know those days where nothing goes right and you're constantly interrupted and more stuff gets thrown on your plate? That's, I'm glad I mean, you and I are on the same page. Oh, dude. From the moment I woke up this morning, the first meeting was an hour behind, so I lost an hour in the meeting. And then anything I touched required seven more steps. And then the team was dropping the ball on things. And then my brother was calling for help. And I was like, this day can be over now. And that was at 1030 this morning. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I'm like, what is it, Wednesday or Thursday? I don't even know what day it is. Right, it's, I think it's Wednesday. I'm like, it's going to be a great day. You always got to wake up in that good mood. Yeah. That's your mood for the day. And it was a shit show from 5 a.m. Yeah. I was out this morning cutting a slab in the dark. I'm like, it's going to be a good day after this. Then I get, I'm helping a a friend of mine build another RV park just down the road. I went and helped him. And that was a shit show. And I had 16 or 18 phone calls from the guys on this project. It was more of a shit show. I'm like, is it ever going to end? No, it doesn't. It doesn't, but I mean, there's days that are worse than others, right? And you just want to like quit and call the day. Like it's got to be better tomorrow. And I, I, I'm, I'm going the exact opposite route all day long. I'm like, I'm grinding through. I've still got four things on my list to do after this podcast interview. And I'm like, I'm not going to bed until they're done because I don't want tomorrow to have any residue or any feeling of today on it. Like I, I just want to start fresh. Like I'm going to grind through it all. Yep. And it makes you feel so much better the next day when you look back and you could have let those things slide to the next day. Oh, bro. It makes you feel better when you lay your head down at night in the pillow and you can just go, ah, it's done. Everything's completed. Everything's completed that needed to be done today. So, Of course. Yeah. Because if you're a good business owner, you never complete your list. Like, No, you just get done on the list that you wanted to get done that day. And sometimes it's not even that, but you just... Uh. You're proud knowing that you at least checked off a couple boxes. Yeah. So do you ever find yourself like working during the day and then you start picking off the easy things off your list just because you can make it shorter? Sometimes I do. I always try to pick the most complicated task. Yeah. As soon as I wake up and I can get to my laptop or get to the job site, I want to knock that off. So then I can put the biggest stuff behind me the first part of the day and the rest of the day I can give some of my time to the guys or to the office or to my accountant or to the littler things instead of stressing my whole day about trying to get all my big stuff done. Yeah. So, I mean, I found that I take my, my, my to-do list for the day and you got to write it all out. Cause if I don't write it all out, then I start thinking all day, like what else do I have to do? And I'm not focused on what I'm doing, but Mm -hmm. then I flip it over and I just write three things. Like, What are the three that's going to make the biggest difference in the day? Like whether it's assisting your staff or, or moving the needle forward because you're financing your new equipment, like, but there's three things on your list. That's going to make the biggest difference. And like returning emails is not one of them. No. You know? So, so to me, it's like, I, I don't get to flip the list over to the whole list until the three that make the biggest difference are done. Mm -hmm. Because even at the end of the day, if I only get those three done, it was still a really successful day. And yeah. the other little things will be there tomorrow. Yep. And you can't be hard on yourself too when you, uh, you know, it, it's definitely hard when you set high expectations for yourself and you want to get a million things done in a day. Yeah. And you just get a small fraction of that done. 
you have, I mean, you do have to be hard on yourself to push yourself to do it again tomorrow and do it again the day after that to make sure that you aren't still knocking things off your list. But you can't stay up all night thinking about the one thing that you didn't get done. But at the end of the day, that one thing, as good as it is bad, is still going to be there tomorrow. It is, everything will be there tomorrow, man. Yeah. But, yeah I, think it, I, I think it's a hard, a hard part for a lot of business owners is um, putting as much time as you can in your business, but at the same time, still finding time for yourself. And you have to set time away to yourself to do the things you want to do and spend time with family and, and kind of have that little break. Because if you don't, you burn yourself out faster than you think you are. 100%, man. In fact, I had to schedule on my calendar a stop time because I actually work from home. Like being an online business, I don't need a storefront. So we're, we work from home, but I work in an office in the basement. So I actually have to have a stop time in my calendar that goes off at 5 p.m. that says, hey, dinner and Tracy time. So then I quit working and I go upstairs and I cook dinner with her. We spend the evening, we hang out, we talk, we eat. And then if I really need to go back to work, she goes to bed at like, I shouldn't say goes to bed. She goes to relax and settle down by 7.30, quarter to 8. And then she wants to be asleep by 8.30 because she gets up at 4.30 in the morning. If I need to go back to work, I go back to work at 7.30 at night. But like to me, that 5 to 7.30, that's the most valuable part of my day. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't ever want to have to work through that. Like There's times you have to, but it shouldn't be the norm. It should be the exception. Right. You know. I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, hell, farmers didn't even farm on Sundays. Like, it's fine. It'll be there on Monday. It'll be there, it'll be there on Monday, man. It'll be there on Monday. Oh, man. Well, Tyler, thanks so much for joining the show today, man. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. Yeah, and I greatly appreciate you having me on. And uh, we definitely hit some good points. And it's it's nice to, to talk to somebody that's like-minded for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I've read that your thing is um, we've said it numerous times, but like your advice to anyone out there, it's just starting out or taking the plunge, keep grinding, right? Keep grinding. Yeah. Have the vision for where you want to be in three or six months and just know that the shitty days will get easy. Well, <laughs> get less. <laughs> it won't be every day. Right. It There's going to be good and bad. You just got to look for the good. Yeah. Always look for the good. Just remember, you could be doing the same job, getting paid hear somebody else complain at you for doing it of course so awesome well guys if you guys found value in that do me a favor share the episode tell your friends about it this is how we get a bigger audience to share the content that we're creating for all of you so make sure that you subscribe to get notifications to the podcast um, and if you're watching on youtube do the same thing hit subscribe turn on your notifications and um Buy your skid steer attachments at Skid Steer Nation. I'm not even going to be nice about it that time. I'm just going to tell you to do it. <laughs> if you enjoy what we do for you, help support us. Buy some attachments. <laughs> well, Tyler, man, go get another Michelob Ultra. I'm going to get another Bush Light, and um, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds like a plan. All right, my friend. Take care.